13th verse of chapter number one of the book of Haggai reads as follows. Then spake Haggai the Lord's messenger in the Lord's message unto the people saying, I am with you. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Sheatel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and did and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. For your consideration, verse number 14. And the Lord stirred the spirit of Zerubbabel, the spirit of Joshua. And the spirit of the people. The governor got stirred. The priests were stirred. And the people got stirred. And they came and did the work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. I want to preach today to you from this subject, Lord, stir us again. Hallelujah. Stir us. Praise the Lord again. Preach me, Lord, this morning in the name of Jesus. God calls your face to shine upon us. Move by your spirit today. Stir up the person who is low. Lift up the hung down head and strengthen the feeble knees. In Jesus name. Amen. Lord stir. Us again. Oh, make it personal. Lord stir me again. Amen. Um, the book of Haggai. Is one of the books. Of the Bible. That plays a tremendous role. In. This ministry concerning the purpose of the ministry, the ethos of the ministry, the why of our ministry. Because Haggai is one of the books in the Bible that is, is, gives us the foundational teachings for that which you see posted on our walls, God first. The prophet Haggai, um, the book of Haggai, in a silent way, and yet it screams at us, it shows the importance of the message over the messenger. I think one of the challenges that we have today um, in the modern church is people tend to value the messenger over the message. I like that preacher. I like his style. I like him. So you like his message. Or if you don't like him, he's too brash, he's too hard, he's too tough, then you reject the message. Um, it is so necessary. It is vital important. It can be the difference between going to heaven and going to hell. That you know how to differentiate between the charisma of a man and what it is that he has to say. People have asked me about my political positions that I've taken. And I've told them I uh, divorce when listening to a politician. I divorce party. I divorce in my mind gender. I divorce color. I divorce statue. I divorce their personality. I pay attention to one thing. 
And that is to what they're saying. I heard a preacher say one time, and the thing shattered, it shook me in my spirit. He said, well, I, what I do is I listen to all of the uh, political pundits and the, uh, the one that I like, that's the one I vote for. And it shook me because that's not, a, that's, that's not wise. You don't vote on, it's not a popularity contest. However you vote, whatever you do, always let it be based on policy. Policy. What is this individual for? And if you don't know what they are for, don't support them until you know what they're for. And if you find out that they're for something that you're not for, don't support that. And if you find out that they're for something that you're for, then you do. And here's the thing. You got to be wise because you're not going to find anyone who is for everything you're for or who is against everything that you're against. So then you have to have a list. You have to have priorities. Every person has to have in their life, whether we're talking about politics or whatever, who you're going to marry, whatever, you have to have certain things that has to be what I call essentials. When I was looking for a wife, you know what was essential number one? It had to be a female. <laughs> now, now, you know what? That's changed now. But that, you know, that, that's, y'all were thinking save. <laughs> Speaking of, no, 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 no. First, female. That's why I'm looking. I'm looking because I'm not looking. With the, with the, I'm not even. I'm not looking over here where the fellas are. I'm, I'm, I'm looking where the ladies are. You start from there. And as a Christian, I needed a saved woman. And then from there, you know, other things. And then there are things that catch your eye. Everybody has in their mind a type. You know. Whether you like them tall or short, fat or skinny, you know, light or dark, long hair or short. These things are real considerations. And then there are personality considerations. There has to be certain agreement, certain areas that you, you, can, that you can get along. You don't, you don't want to marry anybody that you, and the whole time you're dating them, you're fighting. I counseled a couple like that. Or, or, or I've counseled people like that on more than one occasion. I, I'm trying to figure out, why do you all want to get married? I mean, they don't get along. They just, everything is a contest. Everything. Including the wedding date. So I'm wondering, why? Why do you want to get married? Because if you think, if you think you are having a challenge getting with one accord, visiting each other. And seeing each other when it's convenient, because that's basically the dating life. You don't, you don't know a person when you're dating them, because you only see them when they want you to. And they only see you when you want them to. That's why you learn so much about them when you get married. There's a whole lot of, I didn't know that. That surfaces once you're married. Because um, um, that's one of the reasons why we recommend that you uh, date for a certain period of time. I don't recommend you marry anybody that you haven't dated at least 12 months. Now, people do it, but you shouldn't because you need to see them. You've never seen him or her uh, angry. I suggest you date them until you see them angry. So-and-so never gets angry about anything. Everybody gets angry. Everybody, everybody, everybody uh, gets hot and bothered at times. Everybody gets hot under the collar. And you want to know how they're going to handle that. The, the wrong time to find out is when you're married to them. 
Amen. So you want to look to see because there are certain ingredients that has to be in place if a relationship is going to be successful. The book of Haggai, a book that is filled with precision in dating, when things happen, if you look at verse 1, in the second year of Darius the king, and in the sixth month, and in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord to Haggai. Look at, look at the, 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 the specifics. Second year, sixth month, first day of the month, came uh, the word of the Lord to Haggai. But notice what it tells us about Haggai. It tells us nothing. We don't know his tribe. We know, we know uh, Jeremiah's tribe. We don't know his hometown. We don't know who his father was. Notice there's no genealogy given. It doesn't say Haggai, the son of. No genealogy whatsoever. Uh, we don't even know his age. Um... Or, or date of birth and, and, and things like that. We, we don't know uh, very much about him even though there is precisions given in date. And I believe that it is written this way. At where This is where the Lord is showing us the, the emphasis is the message. The message. Whatever you do when you're in church. Even if you don't say amen and, and say it every now and again, pay attention. Pay attention. And whatever you do, don't sit beside someone who talks during the service. Um, they, they keep talking to you, they keep whispering. That, that's the devil. Because when it's time for the word, you have to have enough discipline to A, listen yourself, and then be consider that that person next to you came for the sermon. They came for the word. And y'all talk later. Call them on the way home. And from time to time you have to communicate. But I'm talking about a consistent uh, squawk box. Every time I look over, they lean it over and talk. That's not, that's not God. You've sat beside the wrong person. At that point, you need to politely just get up and move because they're carnal. Jesus said when, when preaching, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. When the word of God is going for, you need to hear it. You need to hear it. Train your children to listen. Now, the little ones, the little babies, babies are babies. But if the boy can stand up and talk back, uh, he's old enough for you to teach him how to sit there and listen. Or the little girl. Say amen. So this, this prophet, he came at a time when he was badly, badly needed because the, the, the saints of God had experienced a... A stoppage, a standstill, a low that had lasted for 16 years. And anything you do for 16 years is a lifestyle. You know, it explains what Jesus said when he asked the man, do you want to be made whole? I think the man had been that way over 30 years or so. Anytime you've been sick or you've been in a position that long, that's your whole life. That's all you know. You barely remember anything else. And, and if you notice in Jesus' discourse with the man, the man never asked, answered the Lord's question. He never said yes. He had been in that way so long that he learned to uh, rationalize it, explain it away, he lost all hope that it would ever change. And when Jesus said to him about the pool, uh, do you want to be made whole? He said, well, every time I try to get in the water. 
Somebody steps in before me. Who asked him that? The Lord's question wasn't, why are you in this state? The Lord's question was, do you want to get out of it? It had become him. And the stoppage that had taken place in Judah had lasted so long that the preachers and the people began to say, well, this is the will of God. This is the will of God for us. This is, this is uh, the way the Lord deals with us. This is, we, we will live with this. I don't want you to accept anything except God's best for your life. Amen. I don't want you to let the devil convince you into believing that you got to put up with certain things for the rest of your days. The Lord is able to get you up. The Lord is able to change the situation. Let's look at this. It says, uh, the word of the Lord came to Joshua. He came to Zerubbabel. Notice, the word came to the governor. I like to bring this out. Uh, and the high priest at church and state. And uh, uh, you all do know that separation of church and state is not in the Constitution. It never has been. Amen. Well, there's got to be separation of church and state. See, we got a runaway government. They enforce laws that's not even on the books. You find separation of church and state in the Constitution, I'll give you $10,000. Now, some of y'all going to go look. You got a week to find it. <laughs> You're going to work this week because I'm going to get that money or I'm going to embarrass the pastor. No, you won't embarrass me. I just wish, though, that there was somebody who would say, uh, if it, and if it's not in there, we'll give you 10000 <laughs> Because it's not. It's never been. Thomas Jefferson wrote a letter approximately 16 years after uh, the uh, Constitution to some Baptist preachers in Danbury, Connecticut. The preachers were seeking um, relief and protection from the government. They didn't want a government-sponsored religion like they had in England. And these Danbury Baptist preachers were seeking a separation of church and state to protect the church from the state. It was not to protect the state from the church. Today, we are using that to protect the State from the church. The Johnson Amendment, Johnson was after some of his enemies. And it opened the door to usher in things to where now it silenced the church. First 200 years of our country, uh, politics was all, it was a part of the preaching. Talkfield said that he discovered America's greatness when he went into the church. And he heard the preachers, and the preachers could preach about everything that affected the people, even in church. And when we began to pass bad laws and precedents that silenced the preacher, and it never really silenced the preacher, it only silenced one set of preachers, because the law is not evenly applied. I learned that I was a Democrat at Philadelphia United Methodist Church in Rockingham, North Carolina, as a boy. I learned it from the preacher in the pulpit. It was common for various people in our community uh, doing elections. I mean, it wasn't no big deal. Everybody understood it. You pick up people and take them to the vote, drive them to the place, and tell them what, who to vote for. 
Now, if I was if I was told one time, I was told a thousand. You are a Democrat. I said, well, why am I a Democrat? Because you're black. And that's what blacks do. And I accepted that. I mean, I mean, that's that's that was that you know, that's the way it was. And some of you are shaking your head because you were told the same thing. And some of you who are not shaking your head, you were still told the same thing. <laughs> and it happened to us at church. Yeah. And it, so when I got grown and began to think for myself, then I began to consider other options. That was when I became independent. But I did the other because I was told to do it. And I was never explained. It was never explained why. But the government, which is my point, never sent an IRS agent to see anybody. Government never bothered anyone who would espouse things like that. I learned about the pressure from the government on political talk from the pulpit when my talk became more conservative. That was when the warnings began to come. But as long as I was liberal, uh, nothing was said. And I think that it ought to be applied equally. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. Amen. Uh, talk went out. Are y'all praying for me? I'm going to preach to you in just a minute, but I'm going to lay this foundation. Talk went out. The people changed because God had blessed them. Uh, according to the book of Ezra, turn to it. They were released to go back and to rebuild the temple. Thank you, Jesus. 536 B.C., the first group had arrived and uh, went to work on the foundation of the temple. And everything was going great. I love talking about this. Everything was wonderful. Um, the spirit of the Lord, Ezra chapter 1, says now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord, which was spoken by Jeremiah, the mouth of Jeremiah the prophet, that it might be fulfilled. Look at this. The Lord did it then. The Lord stirred the spirit of King Cyrus. Ezra chapter 1. The Lord stirred the spirit of King Cyrus. King of Persia. And Cyrus wasn't even saved. Cyrus was. Um, prophesied of. And spoke of by the prophet Jeremiah. 140 years before he was even born. 140 years before his birth. God says he was going to use him. And stir him up. God stirred the spirit of Cyrus. King of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed that house. Solomon's temple lie in ruins. This was at the end of the 70 years of bondage in um, Babylon. And God raised up the Persians and the Persians conquered the Babylonians. And Cyrus, king of Persia, said now, and you can read this in Isaiah chapter number 44, verse 28, chapter number 45, verse 1 through 4. He says, God has charged me to build him a house that is in, which is in Judah. Verse 3, and he asks this question, who is there among you of all his people? Who's left? 
Who's left? See, they had been there for 70 years in Babylon. He says, who is left? His God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. And this, is, this, this lets you know that Cyrus really didn't know God, for he said this about him. He is the God which is in Jerusalem. He viewed the God of the Bible uh, as a territorial God. But the God of the Bible is not a territorial God. He's not the God just at, only at Jerusalem. He's God everywhere. Praise the Lord. Uh, that's why we know there's a divine one. Oh, he's back on that again. Well, it, what happens is it, it, just, it just comes around. God's truth is God's truth, and um, uh, we're going to preach the truth. So it says here, uh, and he says, Whosoever remaineth in any place where he sojourneth, let the men of his place help him with silver and with gold. See, the Jews who were not to go, they were supposed to finance those who were going. Give him goods, give him beasts. Besides the free will offering for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. The people left. According to chapter number two, the first group that went down, they were led by chapter number two, verse two says, which came with Zerubbabel and Joshua. It was over a hundred, it was over 42,000 people. According to chapter number 2, verse 64, 42,360 to be exact, left Babylon in the first group, going down to, going back up to Jerusalem to rebuild the house of God. They took singers, they took Levites, oh my, uh, they went. And it was, a, it, was, it was a marvelous thing. And the first thing they did, according to chapter number three, is that they restored worship. Before they built the temple, they built an altar. And the people began to sacrifice and worship God. Worship plays such a role, a high role in our relationship with the Lord. There is nothing greater that you can be than a worshiper. Worshippers worship the Lord at home. Worshippers worship the Lord at church. And worship is not just limited to a style or a position, but the first, uh, the greatest manifestation of worship is lifestyle. How we live, praise the Lord, uh, determines whether or not we're true worshipers. Paul says, present your body a living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. That is, which is your reasonable worship. Worship is a lifestyle. Praise the Lord. It's how we go where we go and what we do and how we conduct ourselves uh, every day. And they began, according to chapter 3 and verse 8, they began to uh, rebuild the temple. And uh, I won't read it uh, uh, to you for time's sake, but it was a marvelous thing. And when they got the foundation laid, verse 11 of chapter 3 says, And they sang together by choruses and praising and giving thanks unto the Lord, because he is good and his mercy endureth forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout. And they praise the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. It was a marvelous time. But many of the priests and the Levites and the chief of the fathers, uh, look at this, who were ancient men. Uh, these are men who actually lived through the 70 years uh, that had seen the first house. These men who remembered Solomon's temple. When the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, they wept with a loud voice and many shouted also 
Many shouted aloud for joy. What accounted for the difference in the reaction? The difference was when Solomon built the first temple, they lived in Jerusalem. They lived uh, in Israel. Solomon had more money. Solomon had more power. Solomon had peace in the realm. Solomon had the blueprints drawn by David himself. And he built a spectacular temple. Uh, Solomon's temple was a wonder of the world, a marvel at its time. Solomon's temple was oft awesome by today's standards. The gold, most people wouldn't even attempt to build a temple and put gold and all the things in place that Solomon placed in the temple. And all of the, the grandeur and the glory of it. Well, when they were rebuilding this temple, which is called Zerubbabel's temple. And if you remember in the New Testament, it's called Herod's temple. So Zerubbabel's temple was rebuilt, was rebuilt in the same location of Solomon's temple, but it was rebuilt by returnees. It was rebuilt by people who had been in bondage for 70 years, carried away into captivity. They didn't have Solomon's kind of money. They didn't have uh, the kind of power and wealth, but they rebuilt the temple and the anointing was there. There was never a temple re, uh, rebuilt that could cap capture the, the opulence and the grandeur of Solomon's temple. So this temple, even though it was the temple, it was somewhat plain by comparisons to what Solomon had built. So the saints of God, and we, we see the divide in the church today. Some, this is why some of the older saints, they talk about church today one way, and some of the uh, newer saints talk about church today another way. For many still remember Bishop Mason. They still remember how God moved then. They still remember regularly going into churches and there were walking canes, wheelchairs, all kinds of things hanging on the walls for where people were healed, delivered, and set free. But many of us were not born during that time. We read about the Azusa Street Revival of 1907, but we didn't experience that. Praise the Lord. Bishop Mason said that it was sweet to his taste. He was filled with the Holy Ghost. And uh, uh, we envy those uh, few warriors who were uh, yet alive who were touched by Bishop Mason. And the churches that exist that Bishop Mason literally entered into, those churches will forever have something on our churches. Even though we're grateful for what God has done. And we've had some awesome men of God to stand in this pulpit. J.O. Patterson, uh, Charles Blake, Bishop Blake, Bishop Patterson, Bishop Leroy J. Woolard. Praise the Lord. Church founded by the late great James Henry Turner. And we can go down the list of men, great men and women of God who have stood here. But none of them as great as Bishop Mason. You see. So there's a glory of yesterday that people who experienced it remember. But we are thankful for the glory that we have that we experience. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't long for that. I don't want to go back to uh, uh, 1897. I don't want to go back to 1907. I'm grateful for what God is doing in 2024. But I recognize that there's dispensational glory. There's things that God does at one time that he doesn't necessarily do at another. And uh, there are changes in the way people think and in what people believe. Praise the Lord. Saints relied on the Lord much more than, than we rely on. On the Lord now. I wonder how the saints. 
in the early days of our church, uh, they did incredible things. One of the most incredible things was building Mason Temple. Mason Temple was built in the midst of World War uh, II, where there was no steel. And there was a great war effort. And yet he built a temple during that time, financed by a bunch of black folk. That was, that there was nothing in America to rival it at the time. Just amazing. I wonder how those saints would have responded to the pandemic. Bishop Mason and Bishop Jones, and I didn't plan to talk about this. And uh, uh, Bishop Mason, Bishop Jones, and uh, Bishop G uh, 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 Jeter and others were conducting a revival in Mississippi, and the saints were being healed, delivered, and set free. And and uh, some man fired into the service. Hit a few people. It didn't kill anyone. But you know, it didn't stop that revival. Today, if we hear of violence, it shuts us down. Praise the Lord. So, there's a difference. So, I understand the seniors who saw the new foundation and somewhat wept. But I also understand the young people who only heard of Solomon's temple never saw it because if you're in a place for 70 years, a lot of the people who left were born in Babylon. They'd never lived in Jerusalem. They'd never seen Jerusalem. They've heard of Jerusalem. They know about Jerusalem because their parents passed on the history, but they'd never experienced Jerusalem. So they're there for the first time and they were so proud of their temple. It was a marvelous time. And so, and, uh, and then, guess what happens? What always happens when God is using you? The devil gets mad. Chapter 4 of Ezra says, Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity built the temple unto uh, the Lord of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and to the chief of the fathers and said, now, now listen to this, this is the, their enemies. This is their adversaries. Listen married couples. Listen saints. Listen church. Listen co-workers. People who are working together getting something done. One of the first strategies that the enemy will use to try and stop you is infiltration. Infiltration. He would try to slip in and work his way in. That's why as a married couple, you can't be interfered with too much by family relations. Now you may have married into a family, but you didn't marry the whole family. I married Pam. I didn't marry Pam, Adrian, Kenny, Scotty, Mr. Hibbert, Miss Cora, Grandma Coley, Ma Buffer, and all of them. I married Pam. When she married me, she didn't marry me. God bless my brother, Heath, good to see you. But she didn't marry Heath. She didn't marry Gabriel. She didn't marry Tom. She didn't marry Mama. Praise the Lord. She married me. And you got to know how to keep, uh, y'all ain't say they banned. Y'all need to know, you got to know how to keep, you know, the main thing, the main thing. Because everybody can't just keep running interference. Because you'll never learn how to work out your own problems. Say so, amen. Uh, 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 and same, same holds true with the church. Satan is always trying to figure out how to get in. Not everybody joins our church saints. Not everyone who joins, joins us because they love us. Some people join to divide us. Some people resent the church while they're standing there joining it. That, that's some of you in here now. Not everybody joins because they love it. Uh, a, 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 a old lady told Ali, a white woman, said, I go to every one of your contests. And he said to her one day, oh, great, great. She said, because I want to be there to see them knock you out. <laughs> True story. There are folk who hang around because they want to be there. 
to see you humiliated or knocked down. You need to know that. You need to know uh, when you hire people, there has to be a, a degree of buy-in or you need to let them people go. You need, you need to get rid of them because they can't hurt you. Fired. But they can hurt you on the inside. Amen. They can hurt you if they're in your house. Praise the Lord. You don't want nobody in your house that's not going to go by the rules of your house. And you're going to leave them in there? And they're changing the whole house? Oh no. That destroys everything. Satan is constantly trying to infiltrate the church. And because we live in a day of weak gatekeepers. The, the doors of the church are just as open as our southern border. Satan walks in on. I mean he don't even get any resistance. It, everything is just walking in the church. Everything. Every lifestyle. And I'm not talking about coming to hear the gospel. I'm talking about coming to take over. Coming to take part. Coming to rule and reign. And we're, we're, we're watching this stuff. And, and we're letting the enemy come in. And see the more the enemy comes in. The weaker we become. And you never know. You never know when you may need a church with an atmosphere that's anointed enough to drop that cancer that they found in you. Say, well, I don't have cancer. You don't have cancer today. And you ought to thank God. But you never know. So you want, you want to protect the house because you may need it one day. You never know. See, none of us are in a permanent condition. Everything we have is on loan. Ain't nobody going to stay strong forever. So well, I've never had a cold. Keep living. Keep living. Sooner or later, everybody experiences, experiences it. Well, I don't need them to pray for me. I can pray for myself. Everybody's going to need someone to pray for them. Someone else. That's why we're told in the scriptures to pray one for another. Praise the Lord. And so we need to protect the enemy because as the Lord begins to move and use us, Satan will try to infiltrate. The adversaries, they came to Zerubbabel and to the chief of the fathers, thank God. Now watch this. And said unto them, let us build with you for we seek your God. They're lying through their teeth. And then I notice this. We seek your God. And then they added this. This is how you, you really knew they were lying. As you do. You can't. You, that's not possible. We've been locked up for 70 years. You've lived here. See the adversaries. Lived there. Because if you feel about it. The way we feel about it. Why haven't you laid this foundation before now? This thing has been messed up for 70 years. You can't feel like I feel about it. Don't nobody feel about the church the way you feel. Ain't, ain't, ain't no way in this world a person who won't tithe, won't give an offering, won't support. They're not going to tell you, I love that church just as much as you, you do. No, you don't. No, you don't. You have no investment. You won't stand with us. You won't defend us. That's fine, but don't insult me. Don't insult me and say, I love it just as much as you do. Don't insult me and tell me you love Jesus as much as I do, but you'll never, you don't ever speak up for Jesus. You're ashamed of Jesus. You won't, you won't talk about Jesus when it's time. Now, I'm not saying you don't love him, but don't tell me you love him like those of us who do, uh, do, do, who lay it all on the line. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. It ain't the same. It ain't the same. You don't like, have to say amen. Because I know what you're doing now. You're trying to figure out how much you love it. <laughs> figure that out. Because you'll find out uh, if you don't have anything to say for the Lord when you leave church. You don't have anything to say for the Lord uh, when you're out in the street. You don't have anything to say for the Lord when you're around your family. You don't have anything to say for the Lord any other time until you come here. I'll tell you how much you love him. Probably not at all. 
You talk about everything else you love. You're a sports fan. Every time we see you, you talk about sports. As so soon as football season is over, there you go talking about LeBron. As soon as that's passed, we got to hit baseball. You talk about the people. Let me tell you something. You never have to ask a person what is their passion. All you got to do is be around them. Because you people do not keep their passions to themselves. If you are passionate about a thing, people will know it. And if, it's, and if there's people who have been around you and have worked around you and have spent time around you and uh, it's been five years, been 10 years, been 70 years and they don't know you know the Lord, well, there's one explanation. One. One. And that, expa that, that explanation is this, is that you don't know. Because you cannot keep him to yourself. The first thing people ought to know about a Christian uh, in the first five minutes, that ought to come up. Are you, uh, I can tell you an American, you ain't got to tell them you're black. You don't have to tell them you're white. You know, some of us act that we talk to people like people are blind. You know, man, you know, I'm a black guy. I mean, come on, man. If they can see, they see that. I'm going to preach to you. The adversaries try to infiltrate. So we, we, we serve God as you do. And, and we do sacrifice unto him. Uh, since the days of Esau Haddon, king of Ashur, which brought us up hither. That is, when the land was, after the Jews fell, the land was repatriated. But you didn't build the temple. You didn't show any concern for the temple. You're not telling the truth. Thank God for Zerubbabel. Thank God for Joshua. And thank God for the uh, uh, elders, for the rest of the chief. Of the fathers of Israel. See a blind leader is no good. A leader who can't discern is no good. Part of being a leader is discernment. You got to be able to differentiate. Differentiate between who's for you and who's against you. To a reasonable degree. No one gets it right all the time. No one did but Jesus. Zerubbabel and Joshua and the rest of them and the chief of the fathers said unto them look at this you have nothing to do with us to build the house of our God said we they were saying to them we don't have anything in common well Bishop wasn't that rude no it was true it was true. And, and thank God they saw it. Because remember, the text says that these were the adversaries. These were the adversaries. Adversaries sometimes come disguised as best of friends. They get close to you to find something negative. They're riding with you, hoping that you just, while turning your radio, you spend three seconds on the wrong channel. They're looking you up and down to see if they can find some imperfection to gossip about. And you know what? They're going to find something because nobody's perfect. So you have to be careful as to your company. Because adversaries will try and get close to you. They looked beyond the adversaries. They saw what well, they looked at them. They saw what they wanted to do. Let me hurry. And uh, they said, you don't have anything to do with this. No, sir. King Cyrus released us. And uh, we're going to do it. Verse 4. Then the people of the land, look at this. Now their real motives was revealed. The people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah. And trouble them in building. Look at this. This is what they wanted to do all the time. They began to weaken them. They began to trouble them. They made it hard to get supplies. They made it tough. They put, they, they sabotaged the roads. 
They did all kinds of things to cause delay after delay uh, and to try and retard to stop the work of God. And then they wrote a letter to King Artaxerxes and uh, uh, during the reign of Ahasuerus. And, and then they wrote to Artaxerxes, if you read from verse 7 on down, and you will see where, as a result of the letter, accusing them of going against the king, accusing them if, that if they build the house of God, they're not going to pay taxes, they're going to rebel against the king, they're going to be a problem uh, to the king. Uh, the Bible says in verse 24, then ceased the work of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem. And it says, so it ceased in the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. They stopped the house of God. They stopped it. The go government stopped it. See, I know some of y'all think, but well, Bishop really don't like government. I love government, but I'm for smaller government. But government as it is constructed today, government is trying to replace God. And government will never replace God. Look at what government, look at what government did to the black community. That may be all right with you, but they ain't going to ever be all right with me. What Johnson did to us, we have not recuperated from yet. And that, and that man out of the house policy. We will feed you, but no man can live there. We'll help you, but no man can live there. Sent fathers out the house. Mothers became the head of the household. And some women cringe when I say this, but you just got to cringe. A matriarchal family will never be as strong as a patriarchal one. And a matriarchal community will never be as strong as a patriarchal one. That's why we will never, in our pre as we are presently constituted, we'll never be able to compete with white men, with Asians, and with Hispanics. Because they have more men. They have more fathers in their households than we have. And every, every, every one of those people I just mentioned, they are outperforming us in every way. Do you, Hispanics, Hispanics, many of them are illegal, own more homes. They, are, they have a greater home ownership than black folk. Everybody's passing us. Ain't nobody trying to move into town and get on the black side of town. And if they get here, they, they get out as fast as they can. If they can't, if they can't improve it, they're gone. Why? Because we, the government. I don't know why it doesn't stir up more of us. I don't. I don't get it. This great society. I got. I know why it don't stir us up. The Democrats did it. They put together a program that got rid of our men. And we have not recuperated. And I don't care what you put together. You can come up with this government plan. You can come up with that government plan. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. Nothing is going to take the place of daddy. Without a father, the, 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 the young boy don't know how to be a man. Our men didn't always wear their hair like girls. Our men weren't always as uh, effeminate as they are now. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. Fathers, fathers, roughhouse sons, fathers. When the boy grew up in the house and as a daddy, he learned how to treat a woman just by watching her. The girl who grows up in the house, what well, as a good father, she knows what to expect when she's trying to choose a husband. If, if, she, if she grow up and the dad ain't nothing, she's going to marry nothing. Because nothing is what she's accustomed to. She saw how nothing treated her, her mother. Praise the Lord. She doesn't feel that she's any better than her mother. So she settles. The next thing you know, she's settling with shacking. She's settling with a Negro lying up in the bed screwing his mama that he ain't, and he's not even married to her. Preach wouldn't. 
So she can't feel any better about herself. A good dad and father, if you are in the home, how about bringing a little law and order? How about doing something other than just being there? How about having some say? How about leading your family to church? And wife, if you got a husband who wants to attend church, don't you be a fool and talk that man out of church. You got to be the dumbest woman in town because you ain't going to like what you're left with if you separate him from God because I'm going to tell you something. He needs God to help him stay satisfied with you because there ain't a woman on earth who can occupy one man on her own. Now, nah, it took me to say that. It took me to say that. You know why? You know what? That's Bible. Now I got to show you. That's Bible. See, wait, wait. you don't know how good my stuff is. I don't care. You ain't the only one with stuff. Earth is the home of 8 billion people. Five of them are women. All of them got stuff. Oh Lord. I'm trying to help you. Hallelujah, Jesus. The Bible teachers, Malachi, praise the Lord. Chapter number two. This wasn't even a part of my text. I don't know how I get off on these things. But you know what? I've tried to tell the truth. And see, the truth is humbling. Now, some of you, some of you, some people's ears are messed up. Some of you are you offended now. But you shouldn't be. I'm helping you. I'm helping you push, put, get, get up and cook breakfast for break. Take, honey, we're going to church today. Take him to church and let him hear the word of God. Put him in a church where the preacher is preaching just like this. He'll do you'll benefit. Oh no, I'm, I want my husband, I want my husband to stay home and watch the game with me. We're going to watch the game. All right. Watch the game and he, he knows that cheerleader. <laughs> and uh, she ain't had any children. And she's tight where you used to be tight. She's firm where you once were. Right. Preach when, and if his spirit ain't right, and it ain't, Ain't. It's not because when it was, you stopped him from going. When he was trying to do right, trying to do right, you stopped him. Now you're left with what you're left with. And you know what you're left with? A player. Well, that's what he was before he met you. Raised to lie. I ain't been sanctified all my life. We were raised to lie. When nobody raised a, you ain't raised a love no woman, you raised a lie to her. You raised to, boy, how many girlfriends you got? If you ain't got but one, then ask, what's wrong with you? That was our community. Maybe yours, you know, maybe you were raised. Hey, coach, maybe they were raised somewhere else, but the rest of us, the more the merrier. <laughs> Just show me this scripture, pastor. Just show me this scripture. I hear you, I hear you, I hear you, I hear you. See, I hear you. I won't finish this today, but I'm going to show you this one. <laughs> so, dude, if I try to save this one for next Sunday, they gonna th somebody going to throw a shoe at me. Uh, Malachi chapter number 2, verse 16. See, yes, 2, 16. For the Lord, the God of Israel. And the context of this. The context of this. He's rebuking the preachers for not being faithful to their wives. And, and, and to be specific to the wife of their youth. So you got a pastor who reads the Bible. So if I, brother, if I bring something up. You got to know. That I've done my homework. 
Because remember now, they're always adversaries. So I don't, I don't, I don't study for your, those of you who are with me. I study for that person who was sitting there waiting to try to get you. That's what I study for. I talk to, I talk to preachers. I talk this for years. You prepare for your enemy. When you're studying a text, you don't study and prepare for that person who's quick to say amen. You thank God for them. You prepare for that person who has come to see if they can find something wrong. That makes you thorough. That makes you go and you check and you check again. When building a house, when building something, you measure twice and cut once. When driving a car, when you get ready to turn, you look left, you look right, and you look left again. Depending on where you're turning. Or you look right, you look left, and then you look right again. You don't just turn. <laughs> For thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel. He said... For the, Lord of the, for the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth divorce. He hateth the pulling away. Look at this. For one covereth violence with his garment. Uh, he cut, when, he, when he divorces her, just as if he did something wrong, he would cover it with his garment. So you're, you're, you're putting her away and you're doing it in a manner to just cover up how you mistreated her. See, and you're covering it with a garment. That means you ain't trying to fix it. See, if you put a cast on it, you're trying to fix what you broke. But if you just cover it up, you don't care whether it gets fixed or not. You just want it to look good. You just want it to be all, be all right. You want to get out. So God says, I hate the putting away. It's good preaching here. Uh, Saith the Lord of hosts. Look at this. Therefore, therefore, take heed to your spirit. Notice what it says. Take heed to to your spirit. The problem is not her. It's your spirit. You, I'm in the book. You got to let God deal with your spirit. What spirit? That fallen Adamic nature that's in us all. And if you don't deal with your spirit, she can't deal with your spirit. You got to let the Lord work on you. That's why that explains how a man can have a good woman. She's good to him. She's loyal to him. She's faithful to him. She works with him. She does all that and he cheats on her. His problem is not her. See, some of you, you ought to say amen. See, because you your stuff, if, if, if your stuff was a keeper, God would have passed that out on the day of Pentecost. What he gave was the Holy Ghost. <laughs> a man needs to be spirit filled. He needs to be filled with the Holy Ghost. They let the Holy Ghost deal with him from the inside out and from the outside in. Especially in this society, as soon as he walk out the house, praise the Lord, all the rest of the girls are naked anyway. Men see more of women's bodies in public than God ever intended. Ever, ever, on a regular basis. And some of you sanctified women, you're showing too much. It's a challenge. You trying to pray. Lay hands on. 
all this brass is showing, you trying to keep your eyes up, you know everybody, hey, you know everybody looking at you, you know. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Touch. Hey, uh, Pastor, I, I have a headache. This is <laughs> well, you, well, you're giving me one. Showing off. That's too much. Oh, that's right. I'm telling you the truth. Now I'm out of time. I'm going to have to continue this one. I don't even know how to pray for you on, on this. <laughs> and he don't know where to go from here. I'm out of time. But do you see that? God bless Sister Kramati. I told him how the Lord has been blessing you, sister. We're still praising God and believing God with you. Amen. Any good? See, you, you lift your hands and ask the Lord, Lord, stir my spirit. That's, that's where I, See, that's the text. The text is the Lord stirred the spirit of Zerubbabel. He stirred, he stirred the spirit of Joshua. He stirred the spirit of the people. Stir us again, Lord. Stir us again. See, they had been in that way for so long that it, that it got on the inside of them. Changed their doctrine to justify it. But isn't it wonderful to know that we serve a God who knows how to come in and stir us up? Hallelujah, Jesus. Your spirit controls your flesh. Your spirit controls you. The true you is your spirit. When you die, death is the separation of your spirit from your body. And we lay your body in the ground and your spirit goes elsewhere. You never cease to exist. What controls my hands is my spirit. What controls my behavior is my spirit. And my God, I want to submit my spirit to the Holy Spirit that the Lord will stir me. To stir there literally means to awaken. To stir there means to cause movement. It is to arise. God says, I want to get you up from that place. You've been there too long. I'll stir you. Lord God, if you want to be stirred, stand on your feet right now. In the name of Jesus. That's what, now, now I understand why the old saints used to pray, stir me, Lord. Stir me up. God, stir my mind. God, stir my heart. Oh, Lord. Stir me up, Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus. If we ask the question that David asked in Psalms 86. Hallelujah. 85 and verse 6. Lord, will thou not revive us again? Revive me, Jesus. Stir us up, Lord. Some of us, the enemy has been holding us down for much too long. And the devil is a liar. And we rebuke you right now. God, let there come a stirring from the crown of the head to the soles of our feet let that come a stirring that says get up from here get out of that situation praise the lord you've been bound long enough you've been in it long enough get up in the name of jesus let the lord hallelujah cause you to get to work again cause you to get back to doing what you were doing to get back in that prayer to get back to living again to get back to work again hallelujah hallelujah jesus we come against the enemy we come against the devil who wants to bring in hallelujah a stoppage we come against the devil who want to make us static but God you are God who will cause us to be dynamic that life in you that's movement in you that's joy in you in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus so we praise you now we thank you now take control of our spirit take control of my heart Take control of my mind. God make us at one. Let us have integrity. Let us be one. Oneness, Lord. Oneness, Lord. Let everything line up. 
let our behavior line up with our confession hallelujah let us be at one let us walk according to the same rule and mind the same thing let us live up to our billing let us live in the name of Jesus loose here devil good God Almighty get out of the way praise God you've held me up long enough you've held me down long enough God give me power to rise above it in the name of Jesus hallelujah stirring 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 stir tell him stir me Lord stir me Jesus stir me stir me Lord touch me again build me up I'm torn down in the name of Jesus now lift your hands and just begin to praise him and thank him for his goodness grace and mercy and the stirring power of God I'm not gonna sit here in depression another minute I'm not gonna sit here self-loathing self-doubt and in fear I'm not gonna sit here feeling sorry for myself I'm not gonna sit here blaming everybody else but oh Lord uh, I've been stirred today. Stir! Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I think I'll get up and do something about it. I think I'll do something about it. Some of you been in a funk. Hallelujah. You're not satisfied. You can do something about it. You can do something about it. You can make more money. You can lose that weight. You can break those bad habits. Hallelujah. You ain't under the control of a cake. You're not under the control of a bag of potato chips. God is able, hallelujah, to do something about those cravings. God is able, hallelujah, to set you free where you ain't pining away. Crying about that man, he's gone. There was life before him, and there's life after him. Because God is your source, Jesus is your keeper. Let him stir you up. <laughs> glory, 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 glory. Our time is up. You might be seen. Our time is up today. Hallelujah. I, I, I hope you got blessed by this piece of sermon. Oh. Make ready your offering. Oh, Lord. I'm asking you one more time. Singing. Oh. Oh, Lord. I'm asking you one more time I'm, oh, oh, oh Lord I'm, I'm asking you one more time oh Jesus strengthen me where I'm weak Lord Jesus strengthen me where I'm weak, oh Lord, strengthen me where I'm weak and build me up where I'm torn down. Oh, lift your right hand, oh Lord, Father, bless the offering in Jesus' name, amen. One more time, somebody say, oh, oh.